yeah, so I'm um, Steph. I'm the Museum Collections Project Manager Brackets Archaeology at Swindon Museum and Art Gallery. And I'm Alice, and I'm a research assistant associate. I never really know which, but I'm a researcher <laughs> on a um, Leverhulme funded research project at Cardiff University. And I e emailed Steph and said, Can I come look at your medieval collections, please? And she said, um, What exactly in the medieval collections would you like to look at? So I asked her a slightly bonkers question yeah. and then had to slim that down. <laughs> yeah, so basically, what I think we are really going to talk to you about is a situation that didn't start out in potentially the best of circumstances and how we managed to work together to come up with some really great outcomes for both of our organisations. So, do you want to? Yeah. Okay, so I'll introduce you to, to the project that I'm working on. It's titled Living Standards and Material Culture in English Rural Households 1300 to 1600. <laughs> and at the bottom, there's the medievalobjects.wordpress.com is our website if you want to go to there to have um, a further look. And basically, we're looking at the evidence, um, historical and archaeological evidence, for changes in living standards over those 300, um, that 300-year 300 period. Um, as a project team, there's quite a few of us on this. This is an interdisciplinary project between a team of historians um, from Cambridge University and um, archaeologists um, based at Cardiff University. The um, Cambridge, uh, the historians, sorry, are looking at Ishita and coroner's records and they're looking at the material culture or the objects basically that are listed within these documents and um, creating massive databases basically for all of this material. <clears throat> and archaeologically, as comparative information, um, we've been gathering together data from archaeological excavations and specifically stratified objects. Um, to look at material culture from um, lower status rural households on the whole. That's sort of uh, what, what we've been aiming for. It's, it's a slightly um, ambitious project, as these things always are, um, to, in order to get the funding in the first place. And so we have been looking at 15 counties across uh, England and each of these county case studies um, has required a visit to the HER office, or not a visit, but an inquiry, basically, again, to ask for, can I have all your medieval data, please? And um, to go through that and to collect all the information on each object for if, if they've occurred on a site. And then further to that, we have then chosen two county case studies, so for Worcestershire and Hampshire and Wiltshire, and uh, for these, we have gone further and we have looked at urban sites as well as rural sites and looking at high status as well as um, low status sites too. So it's, it's, it's absolutely massive, really. <laughs> um, one of the important things to emphasise, I think, here is that um, Wiltshire wasn't actually an initial case study uh, uh, detailed case study for us, we were going to look at Hampshire, but when the Hampshire Cultural Trust was reorganised, cut, whatever you want to say, <laughs> um, our priorities slightly changed, partly because um, time timing within the project, I had to get the data collection done within this year and didn't feel that with the change in staff and the way in th which things were going, Hampshire would be a case study that we could actually successfully um, embark on. So I said, uh, suggested that we used Wiltshire instead, knowing that um, <clears throat> the collections within the county were accessible, which was the really key point. <laughs> and that's at, at that point, it's when I came to Steph to um, ask for her help. <laughs> yeah, so if anybody's uh, heard me talk about my project before, it's a fixed term HLF funded project, which aims to um, <coughs> rediscover, reorganize, and understand Swindon Museum's um, archeology span collections. At the beginning of the project, this was the state of our storage. Um, <laughs> It's incredibly cluttered. Um, I turned up on the first day and they said, oh, um, according to our documentation, 
there's seven archaeology objects in our collection. And I was like, I, I mean, don't quote me, but that sounds incredibly wrong <laughs> to me. <laughs> And it was because what we actually have is two buildings worth, um, including this, which um, is a massive warehouse where the um, council has recently started doing their recycling. So it's all open, all very dusty, horrible. Um, and essentially, when I started the project, the archaeology was entirely undocumented. So you went and you could see boxes, but you didn't really know what they were. They were terribly labelled <laughs> nine times out of ten. Um, and they weren't correlated with documentation. We had a lot of just loose paperwork around the place, but none of it really matched together. Um, we didn't have a, um, an electronic, we didn't have a database or anything like this. Um, this is honestly not very long ago. Um, and we didn't have a card index or anything. It was a, it, the, the state of documentation was, was pretty rough. Um, by the time Alice got in contact, we were looking a lot better. Oh, I just like putting this in sometimes to make myself, remind myself how good, how good we've got now. But in relation to other archaeological collections, it's still very poorly documented. So we have groups of sites now, so um, sites which we thought were reasonably small, it actually turns out were big, it's just that boxes from the sites were in four different buildings so you didn't notice that, that it was a huge site and um, but what I kind of had was a, a vague list of things we had um, all of the stuff from the old unit that had gone bust in the late 80s that never been written up a lot of problems that would be familiar to a lot of people and um, just affecting basically the entirety of our archaeology collection <laughs> So Alice got in touch and what she sent me was an email, which as she says, said, can I come and see your, your medieval material? I said, what? And she said, you know, sort of basically everything. And my exact phrase was, I didn't know Alice at the time, my exact phrase to my colleague was, it's funny, I know people who say she's very good, but this inquiry is pretty insane. So I don't really know what to do with this, to be honest with you. Um, it was one of those things where you think, have I misunderstood what's happening? So um, I, I got Alice to email me a little bit more detail about what she wanted. She sent me, I checked back, five pages of print out from the HER of sites that she would ideally like to see. Um, and one of our big issues that we deal with is that our collections do not in any way match across to the HER records. The HER is run by Wiltshire, we're in Swindon, we're different local authorities, therefore never the twain shall meet or discuss anything ever. Um, so a lot of times people will come with an HER number and the description of the site will literally be something like North Swindon, Solar Farm Swindon, and you, you're just thinking, lovely, I can't tell you what this is in my store. So we had, I think, um, a very frank, open conversation about what was possible. To be honest with you, one of my first instinct was just to say, no, this is a big project. You should, ha as you know, you were developing this project, have taken into account more the needs of your museum partners. This is going to take a hell of a lot of time. And I, I just was a little bit annoyed by it in all honesty <laughs> and to be very very fair to Alice she entirely understood that and one of the things that really made me think we could probably work through it was one of the first things she said was I know I'm really sorry what can we do to kind of to make it work and um, so what we did um was to to go in and I really thought about what she could give us as a museum that would make it worth m me spending my time. Where we keep our archaeology is off-site, it's not in the museum, we're a very small museum staff, so a person being out of the building can cause a lot of problems. We can't open without a certain number of staff in the building, we can't have volunteers in without a certain number of staff in the building. I knew that I was going to have to spend several days off-site and we had to wear that up. So what we agreed before we started was that obviously that Alice would share any of the, the research outcomes 
Um, more importantly, from our point of view, that we would work together to match um, the HER data with our actual archives. And Alice was going to be able to spend time actually researching some of the paperwork that we had. So we knew that that box of loose papers, <laughs> roughly speaking, was the paper archive for those 25 boxes. And I knew that I would never have enough time within my work to sit down and sort that out. Whereas Alice would be able to do that because that met the aims of her research project. Um, we'd also get images out of it and also having um, experienced our collections before, I knew that we were going to be uncovering all sorts of inappropriate packing. <laughs> um, I mean, we're talking the full gamut from, you know, cigarette boxes to sellotape to toilet paper, really, really wrapped around everything. So one thing I said is that since we're looking at these objects anyway, we're getting them out. It's actually going to be fairly quick for us to replace those packing materials as we go, which yeah. Alice was very on board with. <laughs> so that's what we went with. We decided that if we could get these, these things out of it from the museum end of it, then actually this would make it worth worth our time that we would reorganize kind of my work and spend some time because i think it was t about 10 days in the end we spent which is a, a quite a significant chunk of of our time um yeah so my reflections which are on notes i can't see here properly so i'm gonna have to remember this right so the biggest thing i've sort of come away from the whole of this project really is the fact that university researchers should be talking with museums at the point of project development. That's just so, um, that just is overwhelming really. And I think, I think well, there's also a real lack of understanding that curatorial staff are also specialists and also researchers in their own right. And so when you go in with an inquiry and want to do something that you think is absolutely wonderful, a lot of the time the curatorial staff will turn around and say that's an absolutely ridiculous question for our collection. <laughs> you should have come to us and you should have talked to us about this before you even started on, on this path really. And it's, it's quite strange that the funding bodies don't seem to want to see proof of partnership before actually giving the money and I think these are really, they're, they're really significant um, changes that need to be made. Big data projects are now the, the, re, the kind of the thing that everyone wants to do. They want their name on that big grand project. And, and actually to, to enable this to be successful, then partnership working needs to start right at the beginning. <clears throat> it's quite useful also to know that universities actually scrabble at the beginning of every year to come up with research topics for their students and I think there, there's a way in which maybe better partnership work could help um, museums and help curators and help to basically enhance documentation so basic work which because um, remits have changed, the way in which museums want people to work have changed, it means that some of that documentation just can't be done within the nature of work now. And actually, if research projects were developed and, and shared between universities and, and museums, then actually there's a, there's a shared benefit in, in, in both of these, these worlds, really. <clears throat> just trying to think, there was a third thing, and I can't remember that for now. That's fine. I was chatting with um, staff at Cardiff University because particularly the uh, Zoo Archaeology Master's degree programme, they, they like their students to go and do primary research and so they go and use a lot of uh, museum collections to go and take samples and to do scientific analysis. And I was chatting, chatting with um, a colleague and one of the big problems at the moment in, in universities is that departments are being slashed. That's just the reality of it. And so having that continuity and consistency of staff 
to be able to develop and support partnerships is actually really difficult. Because when you do get partnerships, it's not the institution you have the partnership with, it's the person in that institution. And so being able to develop and continue this is actually quite difficult. So I just did a search yesterday looking at um, headlines to do with um, cuts to universities, um, the fact that there was an article on the 1st of November that three universities are facing bankruptcy. I mean, these are huge problems. And so actually, sometimes when academics come to museums, they're not, they have also other things going on behind the scenes, which doesn't excuse bad behavior or <laughs> rudeness or arrogance, but equally, there, there's this sort of having to demonstrate their own worth within um, the universities too. And, but equally, I don't think that people from universities realise the stress and the strain that museums are also undergoing and the fact that there's a massive reduction in staff. And so for people to say, oh, we'll just come for the day, we'll look at your collections. And you're thinking, a day is a day of my time and I don't have time to do this because I'm having to deliver on a gazillion other things. And actually, there needs to be a better understanding, I think, too, of maybe... If, if partnerships can be developed, where the two are standing at the moment and how they can equally benefit the other. Anyway, I'll stop ranting about that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and I think some, I guess my reflections from, from the museum point of view is, is really that, that discussing things with Alice, I think I got a better, a better understanding of what the background is to universities. I think that um, as a museum person too often you get these type of last minute requests, unclear researcher inquiries, students who want to come and you know work there for three weeks because their research will entirely revolutionise the way you think about your collections and you think hmm it definitely will not. So, <laughs> so I think but I think um, I think being a little bit more understanding maybe and a little bit more um, maybe less reactionary, less automatically irritated by, <laughs> by the silly question and, and really working to find out what, actu what actually it is. This is what you're asking me, but actually what is it that you're trying to find out? And also, um, really, as museums and as museum staff, owning our own knowledge, owning our confidence, we, I think, often in this the university museum relationship, you can feel as if museum uh, universities feel like you're a sort of a a service they can just access. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you're not doing anything else except waiting for a university to bring an exciting project. And you will then jump to it having just been asleep for the rest of the time i'm not certain <laughs> um but actually you know when alice sent me that big five page list of things i looked at that and automatically said anything by this by this company we won't have the adorn deposit anything by these two archaeologists um they'll be in their houses, I can give you their contact details, you can't contact him between January and August because he goes off and does um, the lecture circuit. You can contact him, but you need to send at least three emails and at that point he will get in touch with you. And um, you know, that's information that immediately is useful to somebody who's coming into an environment that they're not used to. Um, but also for us, it was incredibly positive to be able to say, actually, it, okay, we can work on this project, but you do need to give us our money's worth. And having the confidence, instead of just saying, no, we haven't really got time for this, we can make time if you fulfill the following set of criteria, I think worked out well for everybody. And also, I think as more of us have to spread our time around, and you're not at all, so I'm an archaeologist. My background's actually in osteoarchaeology. And I only, there's only one other member of collection staff at Swindon Museum and Art Gallery. She's an art historian. So having somebody else in our archaeology collections who understood archaeology and also understood a different aspect of archaeology 
to me was really, really exciting because I was able to to show Alice some things that I didn't have a lot of interest in or we just would walk around and for example, um, it turns out that we have um, the archive from the Mighty Kiln site, which is a medieval kiln. I'm looking, I'm just checking. Uh, I've got this right. <laughs> medieval kiln that um, is used to date a lot of pottery in the area. Now, everybody always talks about what's oh, mighty wet, oh, what's this. So I'm sort of thinking, oh, there's obviously 12 monographs written on this, and there's obviously somebody who's got a massive archive, and we've just got this few leftover bits. And Alice, as a medieval person and as a pottery person, came in and was like, no, this is the most material we've, uh, is, that's in one place. This is amazing. And so I now know that that is a collection that we should be looking to work for on. And I would probably not have picked that up. I'm going to say for a long time, but I might actually mean ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, I think we have learned some lessons, which is that a lot of researchers don't really understand museums. <laughs> that a lot of the people who actually come to your museum to do the research are not involved in writing the project, the funding application, and that often they really don't understand the nature of museums, but that actually we can convert people. We can, we can change their minds about this sort of thing. Yes, these are my lessons. Mm. Swinton has amazing collections, and it really does, and it's really sad that circumstance means that they might not be more well in the near future they're letting me go yeah. that's called for everybody can be a little bit sad about that if they'd like to <laughs> <laughs> an awareness of potential uh, the potential and limitations for collections i think because i was using a lot of um, 1980s excavations that hadn't been brought through to full publication part of the paperwork was there but then half of it wasn't and you're thinking oh, if the other half was mm. just here I had a full, I'd have a full context mm. and I'd be absolutely away and yeah. that was quite frustrating but it's just sort of <coughs> understanding that material the the big one for me was also that units were failing to deposit archives particularly with you where you can deposit mm. but that just wasn't happening and I, I was a bit astonished that they didn't want to get rid of the stuff in their sheds <laughs> <laughs> yeah mm. And then because we, we wanted to end on something positive, we, we did have an idea, and it might be one that other people are all, all, all sitting in the, the audience thinking, of course, yes, why, why are you telling us about this? Um, but about this, this group, which is an organisation that links um, all the different archaeology departments in universities, in the UK. Yes. Now I didn't know this existed yeah. at all. So it's a consortium, they run the archaeology <coughs> day that's held at UCL now, I forget when it is, but it's September. Mm -hmm. Yes, September. There you go. Um, and um, on their website they have a list of contacts and I went to go and see if the SMA was on their list of contacts and it's not. I was really surprised because yes. actually mm -hmm. I've been there and I've given them our stuff, and I've put our stuff on our website. Oh, yeah. so I can absolutely tell you, it's not from Adam. No, mm -hmm. it, and I think that's really in, interesting. And I yeah. think that obviously needs to change. And I think that then, then, and the reason this was set up was to sort of consolidate archaeology departments for, so they could support each other, so they could then um, promote archaeological um, research and study within the UK. And I think in terms of creating partnerships, this, this would be possibly a, a place to start and a place to start maybe putting up, if, if, if a museum would like certain work done on their collections, then that information could be passed mm. through that. But yeah. it's, it's just trying to, to think of ways that, <coughs> that, I don't know, that we would really like universities to under, better understand the the potential that's hidden really within mm. museums, but also how the, to go about properly ad, um, addressing that research and working closely with people who know, <laughs> know yeah. what their collections are and what they hold. Yeah. And that's it, thank you very much. Yeah.